welcome Thomas Givnish. He is a plant evolutionary ecologist at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, where it is nine o'clock or 10 o'clock. It's late at night, but he's able to come to us this evening to talk about Calicordis. Our chapter, the El Dorado chapter, has helped Tom for about five years with his work on Calicordis in our county. We have 12 species and a couple of hybrids. His interests uh, in general focus on plant adaptation, speciation, molecular systematics, historical biogeography, adaptive radiation, and determinants of diversity. And he uses the insights obtained from these. Hello, can you mute yourself? to explain global patterns in plant form, distribution, and diversity, and reconstruct patterns in ecological radiation through time and space. Tonight, he brought us in California. Tom. Well, thank you, uh, nice. Deborah, for that. Uh, first, the kind invitation and the very nice introduction. It's a pleasure uh, to, uh, to be here in California, if only virtually. <laughs> uh, tonight, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, tell you uh, all of you about some ongoing research uh, by uh, my colleagues and I uh, about Calicortis. And let me, um, I, I need to uh, share the screen here in order to uh, uh, show you some slides. So um, first, uh, can I ask, can you see the slides? You, ha you have to make it bigger. Uh, it's occupying the whole screen right now. I okay. think it's fine. It's on my screen, it's quite large. It's big for it's me. Big. Can everyone else see it? All right. Okay. I can see it fine. And, and, and can you hear yeah, me? I see it fine. Wow. Yes. Yeah, I hear so, you just fine. Good. All good. right. Super. Okay. Everyone anyway. go back on mute, please. <laughs> uh, so tonight I'd like to uh, tell you about some ongoing research uh, by my colleagues and I, uh, with um, uh, especially uh, strong efforts uh, by my uh, postdoc, uh, Nisa Karimi, shown here, uh, aimed at using DNA sequence data to reconstruct uh, evolutionary relationships and historical biogeography and floral evolution in the remarkable genus Calicortis. So Calicortis includes 72 species of bulbous herbs with flowers of kaleidoscopic variety and exquisite beauty. It has a uh, center of diversity in California and ranges north to British Columbia, west to the Dakotas and south to uh, Mexico. Calicortis has undergone striking radiations in flower form, in habitat and in substrate preferences. Uh, most species are endemic to or, or restricted to small geographic areas. The principal floral syndromes in Calicortis include first mariposas, marked by large, brightly colored tulip-like blossoms with erect petals that bear conspicuous spots of contrasting hue. Uh, cat's ears with smaller spreading petals densely covered with trichomes or hairs. Star tulips with spreading glabrous or smooth petals. And fairy lanterns with nodding bell-shaped uh, closed or nearly closed flowers. Different species inhabit deserts, grasslands, chaparral, mountain meadows, vernal pools, alkali springs, montane woodlands and scrub, and temperate and subtropical forests. One quarter of Calicorda species occur on or are restricted to serpentine and presumably are adapted to the unusually high levels of magnesium and various heavy metals on such substrates. Almost all serpentine species of Calicortis are restricted to California and Southern Oregon, where outcrops, outcrops of uh, serpentine and other ultramafic rocks are unusually common from a global perspective. Regionally within California, Calicortis species are strongly associated with mountain ranges, the North and South Coast ranges, the transverse and peninsular ranges, the Tehachapi Mountains, the Sierra Nevada, the Siskiyou slash Klamath Mountains to the north, and the southern end of the Cascades in northwestern California. Calicortis is, as you can see, nearly absent from the Central Valley, the high peaks of the Sierra Nevada and White Mountains, and the most arid parts of deserts. 
Calicortis is a member of Liliaceae, a monocot family distributed widely in the Northern Hemisphere, which today includes 15 genera and about 625 species worldwide. Liliaceae to California include, as you can see here, eight genera and 100 species, making California one of the family's centers of diversity, in addition to East Asia, the Himalayas, and parts of Europe. Calicortis, with 44 species, is by far the largest genus of Liliaceae in the native California flora, followed by Fertilaria with 21 species, Erythronium with 16 species, Lilium with 12, Prosartes with three, Clintonia with two, and Streptopus and Scoliopus with one species each. Lilium, by the way, shows an unusually wide range of habitats and floral syndromes worldwide and in California. Uh, and my colleagues are and I are currently wrapping up another major study on that group as well, using DNA sequences to shed light on relationships among species, uh, the history of uh, lily uh, geographic spread across the globe, and uh, evidence for floral adaptation to different groups of pollinators. Now, uh, looking at this slide, Lilium and Fritillaria are sister to each other. That is, they are each other's closest relatives. Erythronium is a more distant relative of uh, both these genera and is itself sister to the tulips of Eurasia. Blue bee, pardon me, blue bee lilies uh, of the genus Clintonia are sister to Mediola from Eastern North America. Uh, those two genera are jointly sister to the lineage, uh, including most of the members of Liliaceae. Scoliopus, the slink pods, uh, are, are sister to Prosartes, the, the fairy bells, and both are jointly sister to Streptopus, the twisted stalks. These three genera form a clade, that is to say the lineage formed by all the descendants of uh, their common ancestor. And this clade together with the genus Tricertus, the toad lilies of East Asia, and Calicortus are in some pattern that's still not completely uh, settled, the earliest divergent uh, genera of Liliaceae and jointly or successfully or successively are uh, sister to all other members of the family. Now, modern uh, studies of the evolution of Calicortus began with a 1940 monograph by Marion Ownby. Ownby's research was remarkable for its time in the detailed uh, data on anatomy, details of morphology, on chromosome numbers, and geographic distributions uh, that he used to infer uh, patterns of evolutionary relationships and propose a natural classification uh, that he meant to reflect uh, those relationships. Ombi never became as famous as the uh, leading uh, um, evolutionary botanists of the California school, including such luminaries as Clausen, Keck, and Heisey, Stebbins, Lewis, Baker, and Raven, perhaps because Ombi uh, never reached for the general principles that those scientists did but he achieved some measure of fame for a study on Calicortis, and especially for documenting uh, an a ongoing pattern of hybrid speciation involving polyploid crosses among three introduced species of Tragopogon in Western Washington. And indeed, scientists are still studying uh, that uh, ongoing process of speciation. Now within Calicortis, Ownby recognized three uh, subgenera or, or sections as I've listed them here and divided each of uh, those uh, into four subsections. Section ca uh, Calicortus is marked by capsules uh, with three wings, uh, a single basal leaf that is present during flowering, a rather umbrella-like inflorescence, and smooth membranous bulb coats. Section Mariposa is characterized by three-angled capsules by flowering after the basal leaf has uh, withered, by a monochasial inflorescence in which the flower stem branches uh, are repeatedly just to one side, and smooth membranous bulb coats. And finally, section Cyclobothra uh, also has three angled capsules and a monochasial inflorescence, but there is a fibrous uh, reticulate bulb coat. Now within um, uh, section Calicortis, uh, su subsection Pulcelli, the beautiful ones, uh, is marked by nodding uh, fairy lantern flowers and nodding fruits and consists of the California species Albus, Amoenus, Rachii, 
Amabilis and Pulchellus, with flowers of the last species inspiring the logo of the Jepson herbarium. Subsection Eleganti uh, is marked by cat's ear flowers and nodding fruits, and includes such Western <laughs> species as Tomii, uh, Monophyllus, Epiculatus, Ceruleus, and Elegans, uh, uh, shown uh. on the slide. Can you hear me? Um, I, I'm hearing a, a little bit of chatter in the background. Okay. If someone is not on mute. If you kindly, everyone be on mute, that would be nice. Thank you. Uh, that would be good. And then subsection nudie includes uh, species with nodding fruits and star tulip flowers, marked by glabrous or hairless petals, um, including um, umbilatus, uniflorus, uh, minimus, and nudus, among many others. Well, no, pardon me. I guess within that section, those are the only ones present. And then finally, uh, subsection nudity is marked by erect capsules and petals with long, sparse hairs or dense, shorter hairs and include such Western species as Lili, Longibarbatus, Eurycarpus, Persistens, and Tiburonensis, and a group of four closely related species on serpentine outcrops from the Siskiyous. Calicordus tiburonensis, by the way, uh, was not known to own bee and was tentatively and really controversially placed in the section based on its floral form by Hill in 1973, despite bulb coats that should have placed it in a section Cycla Bothra. Now within um, section Mariposa, the first three subsections share glands at the base of each petal, which are depressed and surrounded by a membrane. Subsection Macrocarpi consists of a single species, Macrocarpus, out at the end of the line there, with sepals much longer than the petals. Section Gunasoniana, pardon me, Gunasoniani, uh, consists of two species, ambiguous and gunasonii, which have oblong glands, uh, a narrow and discontinuous membrane, and petal hairs that are branched and gland-tipped. Section notelliani has circular glands with a broad continuous membrane and unbranched petal hairs, and includes uh, several uh, uh, species like natalii, invenustus, concolor, and uh, Kennedy, I uh, shown here, uh, and uh, uh, many others, um, such as uh, uh, Brunoensis, uh, uh, Panamentensis, Excavatus, Aureus, and Clavatus. Finally, uh, the large subsection Venusti has glands that lack a membrane and are not depressed. They have happy glands. No, just joking. Uh, the, the species shown are Catalini, Flexuosus, uh, Palmeri and striatus in the first row, and Superbus, Venustus, Luteus, and Leishlinii in the second row. And these are uh, just a, a portion of, of the members uh, of those um, subsection of that subsection. Finally, uh, in um, the um, uh, section uh, Cyclobothra, uh, subsection Weedii uh, occurs on the southern California coast while the remaining uh, three subsections occur solely in Mexico. The first two subsections have erect flowers. And of those two, subsection Weedii has conspicuously bearded petals, as you can see, and uh, includes the species Weedii, Plumeri, uh, Bispoensis, that's the, that's the third one over there. And it, it surely wins the, the Cousin It Award for Calicordus, if not for all North American uh, uh, monocots with its bizarre flowers. And uh, Frembriatus. Subsection uh, Visbrechtiani has inconspicuously bearded petals and often small flowers and includes such species as Exilus, Visbrechtii, Fuscus, Venustilus, and the recently described Ombii. Subsections Barbati and Purporii have nodding flowers with conspicuously bearded and unbearded petals respectively. Where body includes such species as Barbados, Balsensis, Nigrosens, and the recently described Marcelli, uh, shown on uh, this uh, slide. And Purporii includes Cernuus, Foliosus, Hartwigii, Purporius, and Spatulatus, many of which have flowers that strongly resemble those of Fritillaria, uh, raising the question as to whether there is a um, uh, mimicry, some sort of more floral mimicry involved uh, in the evolution. Uh, of this subsection. 
Now, uh, a, a superb guide uh, to Calicornis, including uh, beautiful photos of each species and lucid descriptions of their morphology, geographic distribution, habitat, and taxonomic history is provided in this wonderful book by uh, Mary Gerritsen and Ron Parsons, uh, which was informed by their extensive travels and love for the group, and which I hope is familiar to uh, many members of tonight's audience. Now, rigorous uh, analyses of relationships within Calicornis and what they mean for the historical pattern of speciation and geographic spread within the genus, as well as patterns of chromosomal evolution and the rise of different floral syndromes began in 2004 with a paper by my student, Tom Patterson and myself. We amplified and uh, uh, obtained the DNA sequence of one gene and two rapidly evolving non-coding spacer regions from the circular chloroplast genome for all but five of the Calicorda species then known. We use these data and an early analytical technique known as parsimony to obtain the first molecular phylogeny or family tree for Calicordus, inferring relationships among species by asking which branching pattern would have required the fewest substitutions of individual bases of A's and T's and C's and G's in the DNA strands. Uh, and uh, uh, so this uh, figure encapsulates that phylogeny. Um, here uh, in this drawing, the present day species and their DNA sequences are represented by the ends of each branch on the right. The nodes to the left deeper in time effectively uh, where uh, branches come together indicate the hypothetical or the inferred ancestors uh, for those species or uh, um, larger uh, groups of species. This figure is what we call a cladogram so its branching pattern or topology indicates the patterns of relationships between species and lineages of species. But in this cladogram, the distances along the branches are meaningless and they uh, do not indicate either the inferred amount of genetic change along each branch nor the inferred amount of time elapsed. I will show later uh, from more recent uh, uh, findings that we, uh, we've uh, been developing uh, diagrams that show those, those things. So the classification of each species or lineage of species with inferred ancestors <clears throat> um, based on uh, own bees subsections is indicated by branch color and was uh, again deduced by the principle of parsimony. The number above each branch is the bootstrap support for that branch in the analysis based on what proportion of the most frequently obtained branches shown here arose from random uh, resamplings of the um, uh, sequence data and then uh, analyzing uh, those random resamplings. The higher the bootstrap value, uh, the greater the support for that branch, that relationship, the, the uh, more certain we are uh, of its validity. Now, as you can uh, see, we recognize seven major clades, each of them named after its distinctive geographic distribution. Bootstrap support for these major clades and uh, relationships among them varied from 65 to 100%, uh, usually at the high end, however. Uh, relationships within these clades, however, were often unresolved or poorly supported. Of the three sections established by Ownby, uh, Calicortis, which includes our Bay Area and Pacific Northwest clades, was monophyletic. That is to say, it represented all the descendants of a single ancestor. On the other hand, section Mariposa, was paraphyletic. That is to say, another clade, um, in this case, uh, the members of the Mexican subsections, was embedded within it. And finally, section uh, Cyclobothra was polyphyletic. Uh, and uh, it uh, uh, represents the lineages produced by two different ancestors. As you can see, um, uh, you know, one generating uh, all the members of section Weedii from the Southern California coast coated in uh, deep green and another generating the members of the three uh, Mexican uh, uh, subsections coated in light green. By the way, notice in this analysis, again, we're looking here at a, um, a cladogram uh, that um, uh, we, we uh, uh, found little resolution of relationships within that uh, central Mexican clade. Turns out that several subsections like Pulcelli Eleganti, Nudi, and Nidity, uh, which are defined by gross floral morphology, 
um, uh, which might undergo convergence, right, in response to uh, pollinators or uh, pollinator environments. And these also were not monophyletic. That's to say, uh, plants with those kinds of flowers uh, appear in several different parts of the tree. And they certainly uh, do not form clades. Now we used uh, this um, phylogeny to reconstruct the biogeographic history of the genus, shifts in chromosome number, origins of serpentine tolerance, and evolutionary transitions in floral syndrome. We inferred as shown here that the genus arose in the California coast ranges, spread into the Great Basin at least four times, uh, into the Sierra Nevada at least five times, into the transverse ranges at least three times, and to, into Mexico just once. The ancestral chromosome number is n equals nine, with a transition to n equals 10 in the common ancestor of the Bay Area clade and the Pacific Northwest clade, and with multiple transitions to n equals seven and eight in section Mariposa, represented by uh, the Great Basin Rocky Mountains clade, the Coast Ranges Sierra Nevada clade, and the Southwestern California clade. Serpentine tolerance uh, arose at least seven times. And finally, the Mariposa floral syndrome appears to have been ancestral with at least two independent origins of fairy lanterns in the Bay Area and Mexican clades, at least eight independent origins of cat's ears and a variety of clades, and at least four origins of star tulips. Our analyses, uh, I should mention, led us to suspect that the drivers of high diversity in Calicortis included first seed dispersal over quite short distances, leading to genetic differentiation within species over small spatial scales, and ultimately, uh, we believe, speciation at small scales. Second, uh, divergence in chromosome number uh, would lead directly to um, uh, reproductive isolation uh, between uh, several clades, and uh, we believe it allowed diversification to double up uh, in several areas because you had uh, three pairs of clades that occupied similar overall ranges but had different chromosome numbers and hence couldn't cross, wouldn't be hybridized out of existence. And finally, uh, we thought a, a, another a major uh, driver of diversification involved adaptive radiation and habitat, which not only um, expanded the ecological space occupied by the genus and allowed regional coexistence of more species, but may have itself also driven some of the divergence in floral form seen in Calicortis. <clears throat> Pardon me. Now, while uh, this uh, patterson givnish phylogeny was a step forward, uh, it was uh, uh, not uh, fully resolved or strongly supported, and it lacked the data needed to screen for hybridization, introgression, and other forms of reticulate uh, uh, evolution. Uh, and so um, today, my colleagues and I on Team Calicortis are working to overcome these problems and make Calicortis a model for macroevolutionary studies. Our aims are first to sequence over 400 um, low copy uh, nuclear loci and whole plastomes, that is say whole um, chloroplast genomes, each with roughly 150,000 nucleotides over 100 genes and numerous non-coding spacers uh, between and occasionally within genes. For all the species using hybrid DNA enrichment and next generation sequencing uh, and uh, use those data to uh, derive uh, fully resolved, strongly supported phylogenies and to screen for reticulate evolution. Second, uh, our aim is to use uh, those phylogenies to reconstruct trade evolution, climatic niche shifts, and historic biogeography within Calicortis. And third, um, we want to use the phylogeny uh, uh, with other data to study floral eco evo devo, that is, say, the interactions between ecology, evolution, and development uh, in uh, uh, shaping the recurrent origin, <clears throat> pardon me, of fairy lantern and cat's ear flowers. Now, members of, the, of Team Calicortis are shown along the bottom of the slide and include myself, <clears throat> Professor Chelsea Specht at Cornell, Susie Strickler, Director of the Computational Biology Center at the Boyce Thompson Institute, postdoc Nisa Karimi here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Cornell PhD student Adriana Hernandez, Wisconsin grad students Evan Eifler and Patty Chan, Cornell Genomics Research Associate Jacob Landis, and uh, Professor Aron Rodriguez 
at the University of Guadalajara. I should mention that uh, over uh, the past several years, uh, next generation DNA sequencing has increased the amount of sequence data per unit cost by orders of magnitude uh, via uh, parallel processing. Uh, we've made more progress uh, really over the last few decades, more rapid progress in sequencing uh, than uh, uh, people designing transistors have and, and designing chips. Uh, we've, we've been exceeding Moore's law uh, up until about five years ago in, in terms of uh, producing much more power for a given buck. Now, in addition, uh, hybrid uh, DNA enrichment has made it possible to fish out uh, large numbers of single copy nuclear genes out of the vast ocean of megabases, if not gigabases uh, of uh, nuclear sequencing. And uh, finally, new computational methods and supercomputer clusters have allowed us to analyze the resulting torrent of data uh, with uh, the most powerful approaches to infer relationships with degrees of precision and statistical powers inconceivable uh, only uh, five to seven years ago. And together, these three major advances have revolutionized uh, the study of phylogeny and therefore of evolution and ushered in a new era of not phylogenetics, but of phylogenomics. And this revolution has uh, made it possible uh, for us uh, to uh, begin reconstructing evolutionary patterns based on hundreds of single copy nuclear genes and whole plastomes uh, for multiple samples of each species. Now this approach um, uh, applied to uh, 419 single copy nuclear genes is resolved the relationships uh, among the seven major clades of Calicortis as nearly identical uh, to uh, those found by Patterson and Gibnish, but with much higher levels of support for each clade and for relationships among the clades. And uh, also at the same time with substantial divergence um, from the earlier phylogeny for relationships among close relatives within the clades. <coughs> and strong support in most cases, by the way, uh, for those relationships. And here you can see that the Bay Area clade is resolved as sister to the Pacific Northwest clade with the San Diego clade being sister to both. The Mexican clade is sister to, the new, to a new California clade and both are sister to the Great Basin Rocky Mountain clade. Support for each of these clades is 100% and support for many relationships among species within each clade is at or near 100%. The um, power of uh, this new approach is especially notable uh, in uh, the uh, uh, recently uh, evolved uh, Mexican clade, which I've highlighted here um, in red. And uh, now I'm just gonna blow it up so you can actually see uh, what the species are, how we've sampled it and what the relationships and support values are. So the phylogenetic approach used uh, by Patterson and Gibnish, uh, shown on the lower left, produced almost no resolution of relationships among species in this group, but our new data are beginning to resolve uh, those relationships though uh, support levels remain low for uh, some of them. Within um, several of the major clades, uh, we have found conflict between the nuclear family tree and uh, the one uh, inferred from chloroplast sequences. And given that nuclear genes are inherited biparentally, that plastid genes are inherited uh, uniparentally just from uh, mom, uh, conflict between the nuclear and the plastome trees points to occasional bouts of hybridization and introgression among ancestral species. So to illustrate these uh, findings in detail, I'd like to uh, turn to focus on the phylogeny, the floral evolution, and historical uh, biogeography of the Bay Area clade. This lineage consists of 10 species with three floral syndromes, cat's ears, star tulips, and fairy lanterns, which I hope you can now recognize by looking at the slides. Um, it is found mainly in California with a center of diversity near San Francisco uh, Bay, though extending uh, up and down the coast ranges and in the Sierra Nevada as well. All species have 10 pairs of chromosomes. Our uh, preliminary uh, maximum likelihood uh, phylogeny based on, 400, on, on you know, over 400 single copy nuclear loci, uh, large numbers of samples per species, and with additional samples still to be added to this analysis, implies an initial split between Albus uh, amoenus with pink or white 
fairy lantern flowers and the remaining eight species with uh, South Range's Albus, sister to um, the uh, uh, um, Sierra uh, uh, Amoenus and Sierra and Albus, sister to both. Uh, within the remaining species, the uh, three um, yellow fairy lanterns, namely Amabilus, Pulchellus, and Rachii, form a clade. Rachii is sister to Amabilus, Pulchellus, and Amabilus itself is paraphyletic with Pulchellus embedded within it. These fairy lanterns are themselves sister to the yellow cat's ear Monophyllus from the Sierra Nevada. This broader yellow flowered clade is sister in turn to the white and violet cat's ear Tolmii, uh, which occurs in the North Coast Ranges, the Northern Sierra Nevada and the Cascades uh, far to the North in uh, Oregon. And finally, uh, uh, all of these are sister to a clade formed uh, by the cat's ear Tiburonensis and the star tulips Umbilatus uh, and Uniflorus, uh, which are all found in the Bay Area, uh, but with uh, Uniflorus extending northwards in the Cascades outside of California. Now the uh, nuclear tree and the uh, plastone tree conflict with each other and suggest at least three reticulations, some kind of hybridization or cross within the Bay Area clade, mostly, uh, you know, most likely, as I said, involving hybridization or introgression and, and not recent, uh, you know, like last year hybridization or introgression, but uh, among uh, uh, ancestors uh, further back in time. So first of all, uh, Monophyllus appears to have crossed with Northern Sierra and Albus and captured its plastome. Both species overlap substantially in geography and elevation. So it would make sense that these species would have crossed. Um, these arrows I've, I've shown in green to show <coughs> partly the source of the plastid, uh, 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 looking at the the relationships among species in the nuclear um, tree. And then um, the red arrow um, uh, represents uh, uh, the, uh, the male parent, okay? Second of all, let me uh, do this, okay. Second, uh, Ptolemyi appears to have crossed with North Sierra Albus and captured its plastome, most likely repeatedly, hence those uh, 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 multiple arrows and geographic proximity of these two entities favors such a crossing event. Third, one population of Amabilis appears to have captured the Ptolemyi chloroplast and thus secondarily captured the Sierra and Albus plastome. <coughs> Pardon me. Fourth, in the plastome tree, North his Sierra and Albus, broadly considered including the captured plastomes just listed, is sister to Amoenus, with which it forms a contact zone in the central Sierra Nevada with Albus on Melange and Aminus, Amoenus, pardon me, uh, largely on granite. In the nuclear tree, South Coast Range Albus is instead sister to Amoenus. And this suggests that Amoenus captured the plastome of North Sierra and Albus with which it geographically overlaps. Fifth, uh, Pulchellus at um, Mount Diablo in the East Bay appears to have captured the plastome from a population of Umbilatus there. And finally, Tiburonensis appears to have captured the plastome of Uniflorus. Now, six reticulation events, you know, six hybridizations or introgressions among 10 species make the Bay Area clade a rather complex phylogenetic network and one uh, difficult to sort of establish what the relationships are. However, uh, the nuclear tree makes sense uh, in terms of morphology uh, preserves the monophyly of each species except for Amabilis, in which the microendemic Pulchellus is embedded via hybridization, and Albus, which consists of two clades uh, native to the northern Sierra Nevada versus the south coast ranges, transverse ranges, and peninsular ranges from which Amoenus emerges. Uh, present day hybridizations are uncommon generally, not with, only within uh, the Bay Area clade, but generally across Calicortis. So it, it does not appear that recent crosses are forming hybrid swarms that blur species away. Uh, but um, those uh, hybridizations do appear to occur generally where the current ranges of closely related species overlap, which is what you would expect, I think, biologically. 
Now these uh, phylogenomic uh, findings conflict with the morphological classification of OMB in 1940 and the plastic molecular phylogeny that Tom Patterson and I obtained in 2004, but they provide a relatively simple and well-supported basis for understanding the evolution of floral form and geographic spread. So the um, uh, nuclear phylogeny, let's see here, where, there we go, of, um, of Cordes uh, Bay Area clade implies that the cat's ear flowers are ancestral for that clade, that star tulips arose once in Umbilatus uh, uniflorus, and fairy lanterns arose twice independently in the yellow flowered Amabilus pulchellus ratii complex, sister to the yellow flowered cat's ear monophyllus, and in the white or pink flowered Albus amoenus complex. Um, by the way, if that's too complicated, just follow the colors. You can see uh, uh, following the colors, um, which uh, uh, floral syndromes evolve from which within uh, this uh, clade. Separate uh, lineages for the yellow versus white or pink fairy lanterns uh, are consistent with Ombi's conclusion based on uh, their differences in floral gland anatomy. He thought they were very close relatives, uh, but he thought they also might be slightly uh, divergent, might have slightly uh, divergent ancestry because they had uh, rather different uh, glands. Finally, uh, and, and uh, uh, most interestingly in some ways, uh, biogeographic uh, uh, analyses based on our nuclear phylogeny suggests that the Bay Area clay may form a ring species complex that surrounds uh, California's Central Valley with uh, two species, uh, Ptolemyi and Uniflorus, ranging outside this area in the Cascades as shown uh, uh, by the, the map uh, on the right. And you can see I have um, color coded the frames of each of the images uh, with the um, uh, range maps uh, 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 showing where uh, each species is distributed. Now, the Central Valley, of course, is a low hot basin uh, with relatively low rainfall and heavy soils. Uh, it's an old inland sea uh, or lake that uh, filled with sediment washed in uh, from the cooler, uh, rainier slopes of the Sierra, surrounding Sierra Nevada, Klamath and Siskiyou Mountains, the north and south coast ranges, transverse ranges, and uh, uh, note here the uh, lower drier Tehachapi Mountains in the, uh, the south uh, eastern corner. Uh, species of the Bay Area clade today uh, all, are all found in montane or coastal habitats receiving uh, more rainfall than almost all of the Central Valley. Uh, the northern end of the Central Valley receives a bit more rainfall as a result of being at a slightly higher elevation and latitude and being adjacent to some of the tallest parts of the North, north, the north Coast Ranges. Now we calibrated our nuclear phylogeny against time uh, using uh, the divergence of Calicortus versus Prosartes and Scoliopus um, 39.3 million years ago, which uh, my colleagues and I obtained in uh, 2018 based on analysis using over 550 plastome sequences across monocots and the ages of 17 fossils across monocots. There are no close relatives, I should say, to Calicortus uh, in that study or indeed in any study of, of Lily alias uh, published by uh, any of the labs. Uh, the um, uh, position of um, the branching patterns uh, uh, moving to the left indicate uh, the, uh, the number of, of millions of years uh, before the present when they occurred. Uh, they're labeled as such. So you can see, uh, for example, uh, that the uh, split between Albus and Amoenus versus all the other species occurred, <clears throat> pardon me, one point uh, 1.5 million years ago. Uh, the purple bars indicate the error estimates uh, on uh, the time uh, of each of those nodes, each of those T junctions in this uh, phylogeny. So uh, using uh, the computer program BEAST, we found uh, crown ages of 2.8 million years for uh, Calicortus as a whole and for um, of, of, of 1.15 million years for the Bay Area clade. Now these crown ages uh, reflect the times when the ancestors of present day species within Calicortus or within the Bay Area clade began to diverge from each other. The contrasting age was the stem age, say of Calicortus or the Bay Area clade, 
uh, which is when the whole genus diverged from its closest relatives. And that happened uh, of order uh, 39 million years ago for uh, Calicordus as a whole. So, um, uh, and, and um, uh, given that uh, the present day lineages uh, only began diverging from each other within uh, Calicordus 2.8 million years ago, there's been a lot of extinction, presumably all along the way in the Calicordus lineage between uh, 39 and 2.8 uh, 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 million years ago. Now, uh, keep in mind that the major uplift of the coast ranges, especially those in the north, happened over the past two to three million years, that the Sierra Nevada and other ranges surrounding the Central Valley are substantially older, and uh, that the Golden Gate uh, apparently cut through the coast ranges about 600,000 years ago, uh, at the same time uh, that the glacial Lake Corcoran drained through it and made the, the Central Valley uh, dry land. Uh, we inferred a crown age of 610,000 years for the Albus Amoenus complex, which extends from the Golden Gate uh, in the Bay Area to through the uh, South Coast Ranges, Transverse Ranges, Peninsular Ranges, and then into the uh, <clears throat> Central and Northern uh, Sierra Nevada. Uh, sister to this complex uh, are the remaining eight species. Now the uh, ancestral uh, state um, by the way, here is the distribution of, of uh, Albus and, and Aemolinus. The ancestral state for the clade of three species, sister to the other five, that is to say, um, uh, shown on, on the um, uh, right, uh, uh, Uniflorus, and then uh, on, on the left, uh, Umbilatus and, and Tiburonensis. Um, they also have a crown age of 610,000 years ago. Uh, and they uh, are, you know, their, their, their ancestral state is the Bay Area, uh, even though Uniflores ranges uh, further north uh, through the North Coast ranges and into the Cascades. Ptolemyi, right, shown there, with a crown age of 500, <coughs> pardon me, and 90,000 years, uh, as our current estimate, is sister to the remaining species and is found in the Bay Area, the South Coast, uh, pardon me, the North Coast ranges. Um, the northernmost Sierra Nevada, and then far northward into the Cascades. And finally, uh, the yellow flowered clade, uh, including um, uh, Monophyllus and the fairy lantern complex of Amabilis, Pulcello, Pulcellus, and Rachii, um, has a crown age of 540,000 years. And ex uh, they extend from the Golden Gate in the Bay Area into the North Coast Ranges and the Northern Sierra Nevada. Now, overall, the nuclear phylogeny plus present day distribution suggests an origin of the Bay Area clade in the Bay Area with a deep gap in the coast ranges arising at the Golden Gate roughly 600,000 uh, years ago. The simplest scenario would include the uh, Albus Amoenus clade spreading, shown by the, by the red arrow here, spreading southward along the uh, lower perimeter of the Central Valley uh, and then uh, uh, northward uh, into uh, the Sierra Nevada. Uh, it would also involve Umbilatus, Uniflorus, and Tiburonensis remaining in the Bay Area with Uniflorus later spreading into the North Coast Ranges and, and Cascades. Ptolemyi spreading into both uh, the North Coast Ranges and the Northernmost Sierra, as well as the Cascades. And then uh, the yellow flowered clade um, spreading in a, um, a clockwise pattern uh, north of the uh, Golden Gate uh, into the North Coast Ranges and then uh, crossing over uh, at the far end of the Central Valley uh, into the Northern uh, Sierra uh, Nevada. Um, here uh, we know that uh, the, uh, the ferry lanterns get within just a few kilometers of uh, the Northern Sierra uh, foothills, uh, which are otherwise occupied within this group by uh, Monophyllus alone. So in essence, uh, the simplest scenario would involve a ring species complex with Almus and Moenus migrating along the southern perimeter of the Central Valley through time, starting about 600,000 years ago, while the yellow flowered clade moved along the northern perimeter. Hybridization uh, has occurred uh, where in the past, where the two pincers collided in the northern Sierra Nevada, involving uh, crosses between Monophyllus, Albus Tomii, and indirectly Amabilis. Indeed, you can find such crosses today. Uh, as well as uh, in the hypothesized area of origin in the barrier near the Golden Gate involving Pulcellus, Umbilatus, and Amabilis. 
There is um, one gap shown here by that uh, magenta arrow involving um, roughly 70 kilometers in this ring species complex at the southern end of the Central Valley between Amoenus and Albus in the relatively low and dry Tehachapi Mountains. Presumably, uh, members of the Bay Area Clade were able to disperse repeatedly across the Tehachapi Gap during cooler, wetter periods in the Pleistocene. <clears throat> However, this simple scenario is not supported by some of the details of relationships we've seen within and among species. So Sierra and Albus is sister to Sierra and Amoenus and uh, the South Coast Range Albus. <clears throat> That's hard to square with migration moving in the opposite direction, uh, directly south from the Bay Area into the South Coast Ranges. Within the South Coast Ranges, relationships uh, among Albus populations suggest a south to north migration, not a north to south movement uh, as uh, suggested by uh, the simple scenario. Uh, within the yellow flower clade, Monophyllus is sister to all the other species and Pulchellus from the Bay Area clade is embedded in the most recently derived clade within Amabilis. Again, those patterns are very hard to square with a simple scenario involving movement from the Bay Area clade into the North Coast Ranges and then into the North Sierra Nevada. In fact, it looks like exactly the opposite happened. So we like to uh, propose a more elaborate but more realistic scenario for the origin and spread of the Bay Area clade outside the Bay Area. In this uh, scenario, drainage of Lake Corcoran as the uh, 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 Golden Gate formed uh, might have briefly allowed some music adapted, you know, forest understory calicoris is what we're talking about for the fairy lanterns to disperse twice from the Bay Area via music but well-drained wooded sites along river on pathways to the Sierra Nevada uh, with the yellow flower clay moving and sequentially differentiating clown or clockwise, initially north, then south, and spinning off uh, in sequence, Monophyllus and Rachii Amabilis and Pulchellus in the Northern Sierra, North Coast Ranges and Bay Area, respectively. The uh, Albus uh, Amoenus clade, we argue, would have done the same, but moving and sequentially differentiating clockwise, initially south, then north, spinning off Sierra and Albus, um, uh, Amoenus and then uh, South Coast Range Albus, respectively. This um, double uh, uh, ring uh, complex um, is consistent with our uh, inferences of relationships within and among species in the Bay Area clade. Uh, and uh, I don't know of any uh, case uh, in the literature uh, in any other organism that has this kind of pattern. Nevertheless, uh, uh, there are some parallels uh, as well as a number of divergences uh, between the ring, uh, putative uh, uh, ring species complex in the Bay Area clade of Calcordus uh, and the classic uh, ring species seen in, in the um, salamander uh, Encetina uh, schultzii, long studied by David Wake and his colleagues, uh, which has seven subspecies ringing uh, the Central Valley. Now, first and foremost, Encetina apparently entered California from the north and uh, underwent sequential uh, differentiation uh, along the parallel coast ranges and Sierra Nevada, separated today by the lower uh, hotter uh, Central Valley. Interestingly, however, uh, Lake, uh, pardon me, Wake uh, concluded from his genetic data that some dispersal in Encetita occurred directly across the Central Valley from the Bay Area to the uh, Central Sierra foothills as indicated in his diagram and I'm highlighting here uh, with the red arrow. Uh, presumably this occurred along Riverine uh, uh, corridors and precisely the area we're suggesting for uh, uh, dispersal by the two uh, fairy lantern clades. Second, uh, Encetina's suture zone, uh, you know, where uh, differentiated population came together again and uh, had limited uh, uh, crossing. Uh, that suture zone is narrow and occurs in the south near the Tehachapi Mountains, while the Bay Area's suture zone is broad and in the northern uh, Sierra Nevada. Uh, third, the Encetina salamanders have been able to persist near streams in the Tehachapi Mountains, while Bay Area Calicordus has not. And finally, uh, Encetina subspecies differentiated long before the coast ranges were uplifted and the Golden Gate cut, while those events we believe shaped the Bay Area clade as they happened. Uh, now, both of these uh, cases, I think, uh, provide great examples of geographic speciation, but uh, 
point to maybe different mechanisms or, or different uh, patterns of differentiation uh, resulting in a rather similar um, uh, end product. Our results uh, on the Bay Area clade suggest the need for further studies, including more sampling and investigations of mating barriers between adjacent entities on the ring, and especially what prevents present day F1 hybrids intergressing with parental taxa and thus uh, preventing the, the formation of hybrid swarms, that is say within the Bay Area clade, not the salamanders. Over the coming uh, months, research by our team uh, will be exploring the implications of our new uh, nuclear and plastome phylogenies for relationships and reticulation across the genus, for the evolution of different floral syndromes and adaptation to different substrates and habitat types and the further genomic bases of uh, recurrent evolution of the cat's ear and fairy lantern uh, syndromes. Our colleagues at Cornell, uh, namely uh, Jacob Landis, Susie Strickler, Chelsea Specht, have made good progress in produce, toward producing a uh, high quality annotated genome for one species of Calicordus. And we'll be using that to guide the resequencing of several different species that have different floral syndromes. We are sequencing the transcriptomes of developing cat's ears and fairy lantern flowers, as well as uh, their close relatives without those kinds of flowers to identify differences in the genes being expressed and the RNA being spun off uh, in, the, in the transcripts uh, to provide clues as to which genes underlie the difference in floral form. And whole genome sequences for several species will allow us to determine whether the same genes are being turned on or off to cause the recurrent evolution of these same floral syndromes or whether it's truly a convergence. Uh, we're combining uh, those studies, by the way, with in situ measurements of flower development and habitat conditions to test some of my hypotheses regarding the adaptive value of fairy lantern flowers in woodland understories, of cat's ear flowers in cool microsites in the mountains along the sea coast, ocean coast, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and early in summer, and of mariposa flowers with their steeply inclined petals in hot, dry conditions um, associated with uh, their flowering in midsummer. In this way, we hope to bring together for the first time in, in uh, any group an eco-evo-devo perspective on floral evolution with uh, ecological pressures favoring the evolution of particular kinds of flowers under different conditions, operating on specific genes and developmental patterns to create the recurrent evolution of particular forms. Evan Eifler uh, in my lab has studied the developmental allometry of a number of fairy lantern species and their closest non-fairy lantern relatives and collected RNA samples for uh, transcriptome sequencing, while Patty Chan has begun studying the pollination biology of Albus and Emilinus in their contact zone to see what prevents them from hybridizing today. Finally, uh, Cornell grad student uh, Adriana Hernandez has independently been studying genetic differentiation within a single uh, but remarkably polymorphic species, Calcortis minustus, reconstructing past migrations within that species, and most importantly, obtaining evidence um, for a, a strong uh, latitudinal gradient in flower color uh, that may be adapted to uh, local uh, pollination conditions. Well, thank you all uh, for uh, you, your attention uh, this evening. Uh, I hope uh, you have found our work uh, in progress to be as exciting uh, as we do. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the um, National Science Foundation for its support and for our many friends and colleagues in California and elsewhere who've helped to track down uh, uh, populations to add to our analyses. Thank you very much. Well, that was really interesting. And oh my gosh, the variety is incredible. Um, I know I have a whole bunch of questions. I imagine some other people might too. Can I start with a simple question? Sure. Um, for people like myself who are not um, professional biologists and don't know a lot about this stuff. Could you just define, explain two terms that you used? One was bootstrap support. Yes. The other one was capture the plastome. Can you explain? Ah, uh, yes. Thing? Okay. So in terms of capture the plastome, that's probably the easiest uh, thing that's involved. Uh, again, um, remember that um, the, the uh, chloroplasts and other organelles that are part of the cytoplasm, they're not part of the nucleus, they are um, uh, transmitted maternally you know, with the cytoplasm. And um, so when you have a, a cross between two species, uh, usually in angiosperms, the uh, maternal parent donates uh, the chloroplast. 
whereas uh, the genes are, are uh, in the nucleus are donated by both parents. Um, the donation of the chloroplast by the maternal parent can be viewed as the capture of that chloroplast by the other parent. Uh, if, uh, if it turns out, for example, that the, uh, the paternal parent uh, winds up uh, uh, being dominant in terms of the, the uh, range of, of nuclear genes that are captured. So it, it just has to do with um, uh, which uh, of the parents has um, um, uh, obtained the, the chloroplast from the other. As far as the bootstrap uh, support uh, uh, issue is concerned, that's a, sort of a technical uh, uh, issue. And uh, there's a lot of actually controversy about um, what it, it really means. But uh, the idea is this, is that, um, you know, we'd like to um, somehow estimate how powerful um, is the support for a particular relationship. You know, if, if it turns out, for example, that just one mutation, one fixation of a, of a single uh, nucleotide change is that all that's behind it, you can imagine that if you were to randomly uh, sample uh, the universe of, um, of mutations um, represented by the sequences you happen to look at, uh, that, that you might not find that. You might not uh, ever sample uh, that one. And so frequently, um, uh, that branch uh, determined by that single mutation would never turn up. So uh, the bootstrap support, uh, as I uh, said in the talk, uh, basically is, is measuring uh, the uh, fraction of times a particular branch, which is the one that comes up most frequently, um, um, uh, arises when you randomly resample um, the sequence data. So let's suppose you have a thousand bases of, of sequence data. Um, you, when you do the analysis to figure out relationships among species, you analyze those 1,000 from um, you know, however many genes. But um, let's suppose uh, you want to take a random resampling. What that means is drawing with replacement um, one nucleotide at a time from that urn, from that pool of, of a thousand um, nucleotides in a sequence until you've come up with a new set of a thousand. And then you, um, you, you, you've done that, of course, simultaneously for all the species in the analysis. And then you run your phylogenetic analysis, see what that um, DNA sample tells you about the likely relationships among species. And then you tally how frequently particular branches come up. And so if you have a, a bootstrap support of 95%, that means that 95% of the time, 95% of the re random resamplings generate that branch, that specific branch that say ties together Tuberonensis to um, um, Uniflorus and Umbilatus. If on the other hand, it's 37%, only 37% of the samplings do. And as you can imagine, um, you know, the, the fewer mutations that support a particular branch, the lower will be the support value. One of the, the challenges, uh, if I, uh, uh, one of the reasons this is a, um, a controversial issue, um, Alice, uh, is that if you have lots of, of uh, sequence data, you have lots and lots of sequence data, Inevitably, you might have, say, an excess of five or 10 or 20 um, uh, mutations favoring one branch as opposed to, say, the, the second place you know, candidate uh, that has uh, you know, just five or 10 or 15 um, fewer mutations uh, backing it. So if you have enough uh, data, you can get um, well, apparently strong bootstrap support, even though it could still be a close call between whether the branch relates, say, these three species as opposed to those four species. So that's why it's a little bit controversial and why we also have to use other metrics uh, to assess support. But I thought that was getting, uh, bootstrap support was already into the deep weeds uh, enough for this group, so. Thank you. <laughs> and I did have a couple of other general questions, but I don't want to dominate. Does somebody else have a question here first? I do, if it's okay. Yeah. Sure. Do you, by the way, do we want to uh, ditch the slides and, and, and so we can see each other as we uh, talk? It's okay. I'm going I'm to okay. stop sharing, and now we can now we can see each other. Okay, go for it. So, Tom, I, um, so you, when, in talking about the uh, fairy lanterns, you didn't mention the Amabilis in San Diego County in the Palomar Mountains. Has that been something that was overlooked, or we've not we've not uh, ever seen that, heard of it, whatever. And there's uh, a population there. Are, there. Are, yeah. I have to say. Uh, 
Ron, I mean, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with this, that there are a few stray um, um, uh, sample or populations or individuals mm -hmm. of species that occur way outside of the, the range of um, individual um, a, a range that has been typically accepted. So for example, um, there's um, one um, population, I don't know how many individuals in it, of monophyllus, which is restricted otherwise to the Northern Sierra in Solana County, right, in um, the North Coast Ranges. You know, we, we've uh, taken, I guess, a, um, a skeptical view to some of those. And I'm a little worried about uh, people moving plants around. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, there, there, there are cases in, in Oregon, uh, without any, naming any names, where I'm skeptical that they actually represent real. I agree with those uh, very thoughts. Yes. Yeah, you, know, you know who we're talking about. Yes. Um, and I, I would call uh, to the attention of everyone in the audience a great book, um, which you should read along these lines, called Aroma Fair. And um, it's, a, it's a book about um, a, um, a plant biologist in the United Kingdom, uh, John Heslop Harrison, uh, who's a famous person um, uh, of a previous generation. And he had some um, sort of unpopular views regarding how uh, certain species got into, into the UK, perhaps by uh, persisting atop uh, mountains that were so high in uh, say the uh, Hebrides that um, they were above the glaciers. And um, it turned out this guy for some reason, some wacko reason, decided to start trans uh, surreptitiously transplanting individual plants over to the Isle of Rum. And over a series of a decade, he had uh, four or five range extensions, which he, and he, of course, later, he quote unquote discovered uh, uh, them. Um, and um, uh, why he did this, I mean, it just uh, uh, beggars the imagination. Yeah. Um, but uh, like I said, I'm, 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 I'm skeptical about that. I'd like to know about the Amobilis. Uh, so, so my friend Bob Weller, who's on here, he actually has seen my, I think he's seen him and another friend has seen him down there. So it's interesting. No, no visual differences, obviously genetic would, would tell you. I'm also, um, Can I, have you seen any Ron, of the me, for just a second, Ron, very importantly here, you know, uh, the one uh, aspect of sampling of the Bay Area clay, which we have a lot of samples of, or over a hundred samples of, that I feel bad about and what I'd like to remedy in the future is we need more of them uh, from the peninsular ranges. I think we only have one sample from Palomar. And uh, given how important the relationship is, uh, according to Ownby, uh, between them and the Sierra and Albus, because of the shared similarities in, in floral form, I'd love to get some samples of that next, next spring. Okay, well, we'll keep that in mind. And my friend lives down, down towards there too, so right, that right, could be okay. arranged. Um, so that actually just made me think of something, but I lost it. <laughs> um, so have you seen the Uniflorus by Ptolemy I hybrids up in Southwest Oregon? No. There's a good population over there. Seen, um, uh, thanks to, to Mary, we, we've seen a number of the hybrids you know, between species. Certainly we've seen at uh, Pine Hill, uh, courtesy of, of, of Deborah, uh, the cross between Albus and, and uh, uh, Monophyllus. Uh, we've seen crosses between, I think, uh, Amobilus and Ptolemyi. Yes, and, um, I've seen those. Yeah, right. So um, my last thing was, I didn't, want, again, I didn't want to take over either. I was found it interesting what you said about uh, Tiburonensis showing, uh, uh, is, did you say introgression of Uniflorus genes? Yeah, even though it grows next to uh, Umbilatus. Yeah. Right, yeah. I mean, they occur in the same county. Uniflorus occurs in the Cassia Reservoir, sure. but uh, Umbilatus is just down the hill and uh, separated by about a month of floral time, as well as over Mount Tamalpais. So it's a long time. It's a, it, it doesn't make sense to me either. Yeah. Uh, that's just the way it is. And of course, um, you know, today Umbilatus uh, is within 100 yards or, or so of, of uh, Tiburonensis. Um, but who knows what have happened maybe 50,000 years ago. Yeah, yeah. I did, we last several years we've been finding, uh, I've been going up every year to Mount Tamil, I'm sorry, to Mount Diablo and was finding one or two um, Umbilatus Polkellis hybrids every every time we went, I'd well, find that's them. interesting because- uh, Very the, different uh, looking too. You know, uh, that, that's, that, that's, that's uh, uh, great to know. I mean, um, Obviously at Mount Diablo, there's at least one site, I'm not sure we're talking about the same place, um, 
where um, on a dripping wall, you've got uh, umbilatus and you've got pulchellus um, sporadically occurring there with albus also sporadically occurring there. All three players are there. Uh, yeah. the, um, the data I presented, um, uh, you know, indicate uh, crossing um, potentially with uh, umbilatus, but um, uh, given the shape of the flower um, and the, the fact that um, you have um, Polchellus um, sympatric, that's like uh, overlapping with Albus. I, I got to wonder whether there's not some input from um, Albus as well in Polchellus. And I think the only way we're really going to resolve this is not by phylogenetics. The, uh, the, the methodology, as far as I can tell, is still pretty primitive for sorting through all the hybridization. Yeah. It's what we'll do is we'll sequence the whole damn genome. It was just interesting, I, 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 real quickly, just real interesting that, genes. yeah. Interesting right. that they're very close. I mean, they're right next to each other. You find them both right there. Absolutely. Um, the umbilage is just up the trail a little bit, but the floral, it's they range from a, a near upright cat, uh, globally almost. It's just I'm, barely I'm open. Going to, I'm going to stop you right here. And um, Lester has a question. So hold your questions for the end, please. Okay. Lester? Okay. Lester, where are you? Thank you. Um, there you are. The question okay. I had was, um, you, you said that the genus itself is maybe is close to 40 million years old, and, yes. um, and yet that the species that are out there now are a little over 2 million years old. Well, they're, so they're, they're, they diverged from a, uh, an ancestor 2.8 million years ago, and some of them are much more recent than that. So within the Bay Area clade, we're talking uh, species that are 600,000 uh, years old, pardon me, 600,000 years uh, or less old. So it sounded like, anyway, a lot of extinction going on and whether the, the genus is prone to extinction of individual species or, or is that, is, is that not, maybe not so uncommon to have um, you know, such, so much extinction within the, within the genus and the various species being relatively short-lived, it sounds like. Yeah, um, excellent question. Um, I, I mean, I, I personally think that um, there are a number of cases where um, the drivers of high speciation rate carry with them the threat of high extinction rates. And in particular, I would argue that limited dispersal ability, so limited distance that the seeds can travel, uh, on the one hand, tends to accelerate speciation, should accelerate speciation by leading to rapid genetic differentiation at small spatial scales, which could lead ultimately to speciation. But at, uh, at the same time, it's likely to generate <clears throat> narrowly distributed species, which are inherently likely to go extinct. So okay, Les Kaufman. Les Kaufman. Les Kaufman, you had your hand up? Uh, yeah, hey, Tom. Hey, Les, good to see you. Um, yeah, good to see you. By the way, I don't um, want to be in that room. That is a pretty... Uh, Dangerous looking plant you've got in the background. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of my, one so of my large. Uh, well, you know, photography can uh, can play all kinds of tricks. Yeah, those traps are only about eight inches long, not two feet. Tom knows they're actually like one centimeter, but anyway. Um, Tom, they, I, I'm curious about the fact that. Uh, Calicordis is often referred to as being a generalist in terms of pollinators, and I'm not sure how does this fit with this complexity of introgression? Right, uh, another excellent question, and one I decided to sort of detour away from. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, Calicordis really needs more study in terms of pollination biology. The best study by far that I'm aware of is uh, by Dilly et al. published in 2000, and they visited uh, dozens of sites, uh, often with uh, two or more species co-occurring. <clears throat> and they studied um, which species were present on the flowers and appeared to be likely uh, pollinators, not just uh, you know thrips or something that would be eating the flowers. And um, their conclusion was, hey, you know, there are um, differences often between uh, co-occurring species often between floral syndromes uh, in the spectrum of insects uh, brought in, but um, the uh, differences are not leak proof. In other words, um, they might um, diverge with, let's say 80% uh, of the pollinators uh, between two uh, species in the same habitat. 
that's not enough of and by itself to create a, a mating barrier, right? In other words, for, the, for floral differentiation to be the driver of reproductive isolation. And so uh, we've taken that to heart and argued that instead um, um, it's um, uh, geography uh, that is uh, leading and, and maybe physiology that's leading to reproductive isolation. Uh, and that um, the flowers um, uh, may be um, as much adapted to uh, the habitat as to specific pollinators. Now, exceptions to that might be say the, the fairy lanterns, which uh, according uh, to uh, our early work uh, uh, seems to have been uh, visited frequently by bumblebees that are strong enough to force their way into those closed flowers. Uh, but uh, to me, I think um, um, if, if I uh, could encourage a student to uh, work on something, it would be to do a, a very careful but extensive series of studies on pollination biology. Does that answer and, your question, Lance? Uh, yeah, we, we can talk offline okay, about okay. the detail. Okay, Alice? So Alice has her hands up. Thank you. Yes, I had another kind of general basic question. Um, yep. So I'm curious, when these wonderful rings that, that you're hypothesizing for the, the way that the um, you know plants evolved, is that completely different and independent of other plants? Or do some plants maybe have the same ring at the same time, the same movement? Or is everything completely independent from itself? From well, other? first of all, uh, you know, keep in mind that molecular systematics is still a fairly young discipline. Um, we're coming up on um, of order 30 years uh, since uh, the first tentative steps were, were taken uh, in, in, in that direction using that kind of approach. Uh, and so uh, there aren't that many cases, even in California, where uh, people have worked out relationships among all or most of the uh, um, species within a complex. And uh, only a subset of those analyses have included biogeography or have um, calibrated the uh, family tree against time so that we know sort of the tempo of, of differentiation. So um, I um, uh, frankly would not be in a position because it's just not enough data to say whether uh, this is something that only occurs in Calicordus, it might occur in other groups. I, I tried to suggest, I guess, by uh, showing you the slides from the, the Encetina salamanders uh, that um, uh, they weren't that different from our Calicordus for the Bay Area clade. Um, but, um, you know, various people, um, you know, Christina Schierenbeck, I think, is, is watching tonight too, I have been you know, looking for general patterns of, of uh, biogeographic um, uh, differentiation within clades. And uh, there are some um, areas in, in um, California which seem to turn up more frequently than others. But uh, that kind of um, um, pattern that you're asking for, Alice, is A, extremely interesting. I mean, I, I die to have the data to, to do that, but it's just not, not uh, we can't do it right now. We can't really do it right now. Uh, there was a, a nice paper, again, at a sort of a course scale, recently published by Rick Ree and colleagues uh, looking at a series, I think of 15 lineages in of all places, the Hengduan Mountains in um, southern China, a uh, very species rich part of the world, where they were trying to look for, for generalities. Uh, but, um, you know, they're just, uh, I, 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 as I sit here trying to answer your question, I can't think of um, uh, the, the grist for the mill to, to generate what you're asking for right now. It would be great to do in five years, but not right now. Thank you. That really helps. Good. That explains it. I had a question, Tom. Um, did you get a chance to uh, do your uh, nuclear analysis on the Minimus nudus hybrids uh, on the way to Wrights Lake up here in El Dorado County? Because they looked uh, like an intergressive hybrid swarm when we were collecting. Yeah. And I wondered if uh, well, the, you have- The answer is the data have been, uh, pardon the samples have been submitted. We don't have the sequences yet from our colleagues at Florida State. So we're eager to see, but we have not in other words, uh, they, they came in later and uh, we should be getting the data next month, but we don't have them now. So I, I, I cannot answer your question. Ah, wonderful. We only have, uh, if you look carefully at the, you know, at the tape of, of this uh, presentation, you'll see 
if you squint your eyes very hard, uh, you'll see uh, you know only a, a few minimus and nudus and, and minimus by nudus uh, uh, accessions. So not enough. I, I I see you did do the chloroplast analysis of the hybrid, however. So yeah, we did, right? But but yeah. I don't feel confident with one in one individual. Right. I, I want to have one sample. Have yeah. Several because you know obviously. Uh, uh, Annie and, and you and others uh, uh, were so kind as to provide us that we, we haven't lost them. We've sent them, uh, <laughs> but uh, there is, um, you know, what we wish would happen with our colleagues uh, in Florida and what uh, does happen. They produce great data, right? But uh, sometimes it takes longer than we would hoped. Or any colleagues anywhere for that matter. <laughs> or me. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any more questions? Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring the meeting to a close. I know Ron and you want to talk, sure. and I want to thank you so much for coming all the way pleasure. across the country to us. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, and there was no carbon footprint to speak of. Yeah, <laughs> and you let us know how we can help you in the future. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I'll okay. probably be back in in California in, uh, late April, early May. So okay, maybe we'll see you then. Thanks so much, Deborah, for being here. All right. Time. Thank you from all Allison, of us. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Very good. And Kathleen, wherever you are, you Zoom master, you did a great job.